This is the Discovery Files from the U.S. National Science Foundation. I'm Nate Potker. Recent heat waves, widespread wildfire smoke, and flooding act as reminders that extreme weather events are closely linked with climate change. Our guest today is Phil Higuera, a professor of fire ecology in the Department of Ecosystem and Conservation Sciences at the University of Montana, where he directs the Paleoecology and Fire Ecology Lab, working to learn more about the causes and consequences of wildfire and how it is impacting people and the environment today, tomorrow, and in the distant past. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So we've been hearing a lot more about wildfires in the last probably five or 10 years. Are there more wildfires actually occurring? The answer depends a little bit upon where we are in the globe, but if we're in the United States, particularly if we're in the Western United States and Western North America in general, the answer is is a resounding yes. There are more wildfires happening, more areas burning each year, and this is particularly true relative to the last two decades in the 20th century. So... In the West, for example, we're burning about three times more area each year on average in the 21st century compared to the late 20th century. Are the fire seasons themselves getting longer? Yeah, so these, these are, they're tightly linked together. So we, when we think about fire seasons, we can think about it kind of in two ways. We can think about it literally in when the first fire starts and when the last fire is is contained or put out. Right. And indeed, yeah those that's getting longer and again depending on where you are anywhere between two and three times as long as they were in the in the early 80s or late 70s 50 days a year to 150 days a year so that's a big difference and then likewise we also think of fire season defined by the number of days per year where basically the climate conditions or the atmospheric conditions are suitable for Mm -hmm. burning um whether or not a fire actually happens. And that is something that's been shown clearly globally, the number of days per year, the number of hours per day where our planet can sustain fires igniting from lightning or humans and then fires spreading quickly. Those those number of days per year, hours per day have been increasing significantly across most regions of the world. Right. And, and do you... Are you chalking this up mostly to climate change? Um, like things being drier, the overall environments being hotter. Like I think this this past month of June is the hottest June on record. Yeah. So I mean, wildfire it's it's a fascinating topic in part because like a lot of things in ecology, it's complicated, and there are right. are multiple drivers. Um, when we think about fire itself, you know, the three main ingredients we need. We need some vegetation to be able to burn. We need an ignition source. And then really importantly, we need that vegetation to be dry enough uh, to be able to ignite, just like when you start your campfire, you know, like you can have a big pile of wood, but if it's wet, you're out of luck, right? <laughs> yep. you've, got a, you've got a match, you've got wood, but it's not dry. So in one sense, climate is kind of an overarching driver of increased fire activity and and the term we use is that climate change global warming specifically is enabling more fire to Mm -hmm. in more places across the globe more days per year more hours per day so it it's not all because of climate change but that's kind of an underlying uh foundation that that is making it possible so on top of that you know We humans were adding ignitions in certain locations in different times of the year. Um, And also, you know, a lot of places, particularly in the West, the the nature of the vegetation that's burning is different than it has been in the past, in part because we've, we've removed fire from a lot of landscapes. So the way that fires are burning is also changing as well, Mm -hmm. in part due to climate and in part due to the changes that we've, um, promoted in landscapes. Interesting. Um, You mentioned kind of the human causes, and I think historically people like to think that wildfires are more like random lightning strikes or something like that. What are we seeing um, about that? Or what have have you, you learned specifically about kind of what the causes are as time moves on? Yeah, this, this is a really interesting topic. And 
kind of like what I started with the the influence of of humans and accidental human caused ignitions. It it varies widely depending on where we are in the world, where we are in in, in the U.S. You know, it's very different in the Eastern U.S. versus the Western yeah. U.S. Um, and it ultimately what this reminds us of is that there are still a lot of areas where lightning ignited wildfires are the dominant source of ignition. Um, so actually in the Western U S uh, lightning ignition accounts for the majority of area burned, you know, in the 21st century, still, um, 64% of the area burned is caused by lightning. So in that sense, you know, part of the system is operating just say business as usual. Um, <laughs> but the reason human caused wildfires are so important and, and rightfully need to be at the top of the conversation is that the majority of wildfires that end up having direct negative human impacts. So one, one clear statistic there is when wildfires destroy homes or other structures. So of the fires in the West over that same time period that end up destroying homes or structures, uh, 74% of those are ignited accidentally or unintentionally by humans. I can speak to that point personally. My my mother lost her house in the campfire in 2018. That was uh, power, a uh, buried power wire, I believe, that yep. corroded or broke down over time. Or an unburied guess, power line. Yeah. Right. Yeah. As someone living there, it felt like it was perpetual. The, the, the fire season just didn't stop. It was just could go at any time. So can we, can I ask you why are fires getting significantly more destructive as time goes on? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And I think it, it goes back to kind of those, the three ingredients. There, there's not a single answer to that, right? The, the reason that we're seeing more homes being destroyed is this combination of we're increasingly building and living in and around flammable vegetation climate conditions are becoming more conducive to burning for more days per year and more years per decade. Um, and basically with humans, there's a very strong correlation with the number of structures in flammable landscapes and the total area burned from human caused ignitions. So whether we like it or not, we come with accidental ignitions. So that is us adding ignitions and and there's some really interesting interactions there between, say, climate and human ignitions. And I think you, you mentioned the campfire, something that you have direct uh, experience with. That's a really good example of um, some of our most destructive wildfires in the past five years. So the campfire, the Marshall Fire that occurred in Boulder County, December 30th, 2021. The campfire occurred in November. So these are fires that are occurring outside of the of the historical lightning caused right. fire season, and just stating that it it implies, and in both cases there, those are fires ignited by by down power lines in part, but they're both they're human caused ignitions. So we are adding these ignitions onto landscapes that are increasingly flammable through the late summer, fall, and early winter, and those the consequences of those ignitions are are much greater than they would have been say 20 years ago when mm -hmm. either rains would have come in the case of the marshall fire in in colorado and boulder county typically you would have snow on the ground um so it's those things aligning that right. are helping us accumulate these true fire disasters just just getting kind of larger versions of the ingredients or, or bigger packages of the ingredients necessary kind of coalescing at the same time. Yeah. And, and I, I like to say like we, there are more, we're rolling the dice more frequently now because, mm -hmm. you know, so, so whatever we do, you know, whether we accidentally start fires from chains dragging on a trailer or fireworks uh, or down power lines during high wind events, you know, there are more times over the year where the consequences of that uh, come up with with fire ignition, come up with rapid fire spread if they align with high wind events, for example. When I was reading through your paper, you used the term lever. 
And I wanted to ask you about what kind of levers can be pulled to reduce the chances of fire disasters in the future. Yeah, that's a great question. And and I do think to start off, it it's important to understand the causes of, of human fire disasters. And that's one of the reasons why we focus on lightning caused wildfires versus accidental human caused wildfires. Overall, only 12% of the wildfires that occurred in the West from 1999 to 2020 resulted in some sort of structure or home loss. So that's often surprising to people. So the flip side, 88% of wildfires that are happening in the West, no home or structure loss. (laughs) So in part, that means, you know, when you hear about a wildfire, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be a disaster, right? And in many cases, those fires are burning in areas and doing ecological work that right. is that is useful to us and consistent with land management goals and actually helps us in, in the future. So for those 12% of wildfires that result in structure loss and home loss, there are some clear levers that we can move to reduce those incidents. Uh, and so first and foremost, reducing the accidental human-caused ignitions and that's it. it. That operates at two scales, at the individual level. So I think many people are familiar with Smokey Bear, and and his message, right? The most it still holds up. <laughs> yeah, the most successful ad campaign uh, ever, arguably. Yeah. Uh, so Smokey Bear's message still holds. A, a colleague of mine and co-author on on some of that work likes to say that we need to take Smokey Bear and bring him into in, bring him into the suburbs. So Smokey Bear's message is not just when you're in the woods or you're camping, you know, it, it is most important when you are in and around your home. So that means just being cognizant of things that can lead to fire starts, whether that's something as surprising as, you know, your lawnmower hitting uh, a rock and sparking the whole fire. Uh, and then things that are more obvious to us, like setting off fireworks there are also levers that we need to start to pull that are at a community, society, and larger scales. And those relate to some of the drivers of the most destructive fires that we've had, like uh, power lines. So there's a lot of work that we can do on with infrastructure and basically planning and developing with the potential for fire starts top of mind. Uh, You mentioned kind of benefits and land management as part of it. So I I wanted to explicitly ask you, what are kind of circumstances where a wildfire is beneficial? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, And to start off broadly, under under most average conditions, meaning an average summer and an average day in June, July, or August, right? Not where we're breaking temperature and heat records. Right. When a wildfire occurs, it is it is doing a lot of work and a lot of services that many of our ecosystems in the West have evolved with. Uh, so what that means is that a lot of forested areas, for example, w- what we've come to expect from them is in part because of their history of fire. So there are trees that won't regenerate unless they are exposed to heat from wildfire. Uh, there are a number of plants in the understory that benefit from from wildfires moving through. There are lots of different ways that fires can burn, and each way favors different species. But broadly, if we take fire out of our landscapes, as as we've tried to do for over a hundred years, you know, and we've it, big picture, we haven't been able to do it. Um, and it, but in certain areas where we have, we see pretty dramatic changes in both what's growing there and how it's growing there. So, uh, if we, yeah, if we value the Western landscapes as they've been for a long time, then we need to promote safe fire use and safe burning in those landscapes. We, we don't often get the chance to talk to somebody who's working on a grant currently about the work that is happening at that time. And, you have a, a grant right now looking at boreal forests. So what is a boreal forest? So boreal forest is a, it's a terrestrial biome. Uh, it's the 
it's either the first or second largest terrestrial biome in the world, depending on on who you ask. But basically, <laughs> it's the largest forested biome in the world, and it refers to an area of northern in the northern hemisphere, high latitudes, so across Alaska, much of Canada, Scandinavia, um, Russia, uh, dominated by various coniferous species. Um, so it's a forested biome that dominates much of the Northern hemisphere. And it's important for a number of reasons. One of those being that it stores a lot of carbon in soil and permafrost. So a lot of boreal forest regions have, have low human populations. So they're not necessarily on our radar, but they have potential regional and global implications. Uh, depending on what happens in boreal forests. So even though it doesn't feel like we're connected to them, we are connected to them if we're living in the lower 48 or, or at lower latitudes. And I, th- I think we this uh, recent Canada fire and the yeah. widespread smoke affecting much of the eastern half of the states is probably it, a direct link to that kind of behavior. Yes, ex- exactly. And I, it, when I, when I was, when I'm thinking about connections uh, with, with soil carbon and things i'm thinking decades in the future but absolutely yeah the wildfire smoke in in eastern canada which is eastern canadian boreal forest yeah that's that's uh an excellent example of a of a direct connection and uh and an impact on millions of humans what are you looking for when you're measuring fires over time like what are the markers i guess yeah it's a it's a it is a whole to me a whole cool set of of, of methodological <laughs> techniques. In essence, we use lakes uh, as passive recorders of what's happened in the past. So we collect sediment cores from the bottom of lakes and um, literally, you know, like three inches in diameter, a meter long at a time. And as you go down in that sediment, it's kind of like going back in a tree ring. Um, you're going back in time. And we look at things like pieces of charcoal that we can see with the bare eyes, so macroscopic charcoal, we look at pollen and we look at other components of the sediment to be able to reconstruct when fires occurred around that lake, what the vegetation was like before, and importantly, how the vegetation changed after that fire. So it's it's somewhat like, um, you know, a satellite view where remote sensing gives us a picture of the earth at large spatial scales. You know, the resolution is a little bit coarser, you know, but you get to see things at a large spatial scale in paleoecology, which is the the term for the discipline. uh, We get to see things over long time scales. The resolution is a little bit coarser, but if you zoom out, we can see how often fires occur, the typical pattern of vegetation change after a fire and and how long that takes, you know, does it take between you know, 60 and 150 years. And we get to see the way the ecosystems have responded to wildfires multiple times. Whereas as contemporary ecologists, we can go out on the landscape and we can, we can measure in detail how an ecosystem is responding to the last fire or maybe with tree rings, the last two fires, but we can't go back too far in time. So that's what lake sediment records and paleoecology allow us to do. A very cool, comprehensive overlook of now, then, and what's to come. It's it's ambitious, and and no doubt we will. There will be still plenty of questions at the end of it. <laughs> there always is. <laughs> yeah, I think. I mean, I'm glad you asked about the, you know, the the beneficial impacts of wildfire. So I think that it is an important. That's a really important part of the wildfire conversation right it's not all bad it's not all scary yeah it's not all natural phenomenon over here yeah. and then human disaster over here <laughs> we have we have them all um yeah unlike earthquakes and hurricanes and things like they actually they they do provide a lot of immediate um natural resource benefits to our ecosystem Special thanks to Phil Higuera. For the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Potker. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov.